Thanks for joining us at Discovery Church Online. If you have any questions or want to learn more about who we are as a church, check us out online by going to ilovediscovery.church. You can stay connected everywhere you go with our Discovery Church app. It's free from wherever you download your apps from. Today, we start part two of our Ghost of Christmas Past series. This week, our Northwest Campus Pastor Sean Tobiasen will be preaching on overcoming the weights of guilt and shame and finding your freedom in Christ. So we're going to be going over the Ghost of Christmas Past. Hopefully you guys made it last week. Um, Pastor Jason really laid a great foundation for what we're going to be talking about. If you missed last week, I'll go over it briefly. Um, Christmas time for a lot of us is a very exciting holiday, right? It's fun, it's full of joy, it's full of laughter, it's supposed to be like this amazing time. But can I tell you something? It's not for everybody, right? Not everybody feels that way about the holiday. In fact, it's known as one of the highest suicide rates uh, in America is during the holidays. Can you imagine what must be going through someone's head? I mean, some of us, it's not going to make sense, but some of us get it, right? Some of us have seen some things. Some of us have been through things. Some of us have um, a ton of weight that sits on them when the holiday season approaches, right? And so we talk about ghosts of our past, those things that haunt you um, in those times. And so we're going to go to our theme verse, Lamentations 3, 19 through 20. So a little bit of setup here is this is a time for this prophet that's supposed to be an exciting time in his life, okay? So they've been in slavery for so long. They've seen some things. They've had to deal with some things. And so now it's actually supposed to be this amazing time. They have these promises set forth, but the prophet says this. He says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, right? It's not like, it's not like he could kind of, he has to look back, right? I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. And so Pastor Jason, I think, um, really touched on this. When it talks about affliction, um, there's imagery with that word that would make sense to them in their times when they read this. That doesn't make sense now. And so affliction there, the word is actually um, translating the imagery. It was used as, a, as torture, right? This word actually had imagery to it. And so they would be tied up, and so they would just kind of push heavy rocks closer to them, right? So you'd start with the feet, give them some time there. Then another heavy rock is stacked up, and it's surrounding them. It keeps going up until it's literally over their head. And if you could imagine all this weight just pushed onto them, um, they die just because they can't breathe anymore, right? All oh, the weight just sitting on them. So we talked last week about the hauntings of your past and how that does that. And this week, we're going to touch on the ghost of the past being shame, right? Shame. And so the hauntings sometimes of shame that enters into your life. And so the focus that we want out of the Lamentations is he says bitterness and gall. And so bitterness and gall in that time would have made sense to poison. It was actually a poison then. It's, a, it's an herb that had a very bitter taste and you knew the taste is familiar, um, and in certain doses was poisonous and would, and would literally kill you. And so what he's talking about, he says, I remember, right, my tour, I remember all that weight being on me, my wanderings, what I went through, and I remember just the poison that affected my life. And so today, today we're going to focus on shame being that poison. And hopefully you guys understand um, shame can affect your life and help you uh, lead you into decision making that you would never make otherwise lead you into a thought process you would never have otherwise and some of you guys today one you know exactly what that shame is right you know exactly what that guilt is you know exactly what that feeling is that that deep shame that you have some of you guys as we go through today you may find some right and really what we're going to end today with is breakthrough can i get an amen amen, amen. fantastic so i wanted to find those those definitions for us so when we talk about guilt um, guilt is a lot of times combined with shame, conviction, and, and we kind of pull them together. Can I say guilt is really just saying that you have done bad, right? So we know this in our judicial system now, right? You have guilty, not guilty. If you're guilty, what'd you do? Something you shouldn't have, right? So in our lives, we feel guilt because we did something that we shouldn't have. Guilt is natural. Guilt is just something that happens to us in life, right? So I lied to my mama. I felt bad, right? Hopefully, hopefully, right? Or I did, I did X, Y, Z, therefore I feel this way. That's guilt. But shame, shame tells you something different. So shame tells you that not only do you have guilt, but shame now tells you that I am bad, right? I am bad. That's such a huge shift in your mind that we have to understand. So now you may have been somebody who saw some things, somebody who, who, who has been through things, somebody who looks up things on the internet, maybe somebody that's done things in real life, maybe an adulterer, whatever it is that you've done. So now you've pulled that thought, that guilt, that whatever it is, and you pull it and you said, I am 
bad. Like my being, who I am, I'm poison. Does that make sense, guys? And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you guys the effects that that has on your life, and I'm going to show you the effect that Jesus has on shame. Okay, And so we're going to do that through a lot of different character studies. I'm going to walk you guys through some characters in the Bible. Um, and so the first thing I want to point out, the first bullet point um, we have, uh, the effects of shame, is it, uh, <laughs> it, it poisons your frame of mind. Right? So it, just even the way you think is going to be poisoned in, in the way that you go about it. And so <clears throat> my favorite character in the Bible is a man named David. Right? You guys heard of David, hopefully. If you haven't, let me tell you something about David. <clears throat> David was a man that they say was a man after God's own heart. Right? Like David got it, man. David is such a, an awesome character in the Bible. But it didn't always start that way for him. Right? So let me tell you a little bit about David. So, da- so David at a very young age is promised some crazy things. Right? So Samuel, the prophet of the time, like the bee's knees, right? everybody knew Samuel and you had to listen to what he said. So Samuel goes to David's dad's house. And he says, hey, so God told me that one of your sons are going to be king. What? That's kind of a big deal, right? And so he says, gather up your sons for me. Do me a favor, gather up your sons. So dad says, yeah, let me get all of my big, amazing, cool sons, and I'm going to put them right here in front of you, right? Put them in front of him, and Samuel goes through, and he's like, no, 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 not what we're looking for. Okay, this is weird. <clears throat> he's not here, right? So Samuel actually has to ask the dad, like, dude, do you, do you have any other sons? Oh, you know what? Yeah, yeah, my bad. I got that weird one that we leave outside to shepherd, right? I totally forgot about that dude, right? Could you imagine, like, you are so out of your dad's thought, like, as a king? Like, <laughs> he brings them up, and, and we would all almost say, right? Like, I'm bringing all my kids. I'm just, as long as one of them, right? But dad's like, nah, hey, don't tell David nothing. Keep that dude outside. Let's keep him busy, right? So Samuel, of course, he anoints David, and he says, this dude's king. And David's young. Right? And so he goes through his life with this understanding, this promise, and David does some amazing things. Have you guys heard of David and Goliath? Right? I love this story because David is, again, this little, little, little dude who guards some sheep. Right? And so he goes and he's looking at the whole army is there, and this one giant guy is like calling him out, calling names, shooting some, some mean, mean vibes at him. Right? And so the whole army is terrified of this dude. Well, David just shows up and he's like, oh man, hey, <clears throat> so you need that guy killed? I don't mind. Right? I could do this. And they're like, nah, come on, man, get out of here. And David's response, right, little man, he's like, oh, hold up, let me tell you something. You don't know my life. See, I killed lions and bears when I protect my sheep, right? I'm a big deal. Send me out there, I'll handle that dude. And they're like, all right, give him your No, 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 I don't need none of that stuff. Give me my little, <laughs> and I'm just going to throw a rock at him. Man, right? David was the man, right? David is... He goes on and becomes such a great warrior. He fights alongside with his crew. There's all these amazing stories about all these people who saying like, David is it, right? David is the, is, is the man of the time, okay? But David made some poor decisions sometimes, right? So one of them, he's up on a rooftop, and he sees a foxy lady, right? So he sees the foxy lady, and he says, come on into my, my, my house, and, and here we go, right? So David has a little party. Lady gets pregnant, Right? So she's pregnant. She comes back. David, sorry, man. Bad news. Uh, I'm Pragers, so we're going to have to do something about this, right? Right? So this is a bad situation, right? So a situation that's going to bring some shame on David's house, right? So David's response is, hey, let's get your husband. Let's call him on down. Let's have him stay at your house. That way they won't think it's me. It's him who got you pregnant, right? We'll be fine. Well, Uriah, the soldier called in. Is such an honorable man that he says, no, 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 I can't be with my wife if all my troops that I love can't either. So I'm going to sleep at the doorstep. Ugh. All right, plan A, fail. Plan B, let's get this dude trashed, right? We're going to get this dude drunk out of his mind, and then we're going to send him back, and that'll do it, right? That'll do the trick. He'll go home with his wife. We'll be fine. Uriah, yes, he gets drunk, but then he still refuses. David's in a bind, right? He's starting to make some bad decisions. So let's look at where David goes, right? So we're going to turn to uh, 2 Samuel 11, 14 through 17. He says, so the next morning, after all this, David wrote a letter to Joab, who's the general of the army, and he gives it to Uriah to deliver. He says, the letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest. Then pull back so that he will be killed. 
So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out to the city or came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Again, David was like a man of the people. David fought alongside his soldiers almost in every war and did some amazing things. And can you see that his mind was so distorted that he's willing to, one, put Uriah in harm's way due to his shame that he also calls, caused other Israelite soldiers to also be slain. So it's not just that, right? Like you can see David is so torn up. <clears throat> he's doing anything he can to get out of this. The shame has totally distorted his frame of mind. Okay? The second note I want you guys to take on what shame does to you is it kills your self-worth. Right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to kill your self-worth. There's no doubt. So the next one we're going to talk about is Adam. Okay, and if you open your book, he's just right there, right, right there in the front, right? So in our Christian walk, we kind of start saying things, and we start saying stuff like, I walk with God, I talk with God, and pray with God, and things like that, right? So here's the thing. Adam literally did that, right? Like, like Adam wasn't like figuratively speaking. Adam's like, hey, God, grab my arm, let's go, and just kind of walk through the streets with God, chilling with him, right? You want to talk about some confidence? Wouldn't you have confidence in that moment? Like, I'm side by side with God, the one who created me. And God is assigning him, like, cool roles, right? He's like, hey, Adam, you want to name those things for me? Sure, God, that weird thing is a platypus, right? <laughs> Got it, right? So he's, he comes up with the names of all these animals. So he's one with a ton of self-worth because he walks and talks with God, right? So let's look at what happens when shame enters the life of Adam. Genesis 3, 7 through 10. <clears throat> says at that moment their eyes were open. This is Adam and Eve. They've ate, a, ate of whatever the fruit, or basically they just did exactly. God's like, hey, don't do this. And they're like, all right, we're going to do this. And now that's where we're at, right? So it says at that moment their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves, right? So randomly after this decision, now they're like, oh, dude, we are naked. What? Let's get some clothes on. You go there. I'm going to go here. We're going to sew some fig leaves together. So they're like spending time just... Do you imagine lolling over that decision they made, right? You're going to sit there and just, man, I can't believe I did that. Oh, my gosh, God's going to be so mad. Oh, my gosh, God's going to be so mad, right? So then we're getting to this point. They got their fig leaves. They're good to go. So then God comes and he says to the man, where are you at? <clears throat> All right, where'd you go, man? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. But there's something I want you to understand about the frame of mind here, Right? So one, they randomly decide to close themselves because now they feel like there's parts of themselves that other people can't see, right? There's parts of themselves that God cannot see. They've made some decisions, and God, you cannot look at them. And it's caused them to make a decision to hide, right? In addition to that, their frame of mind is so distorted that literally at this time, it's Adam, Eve, God, right? Like th this is, this is their, their life. This is the person that they love so much. And he shows up, and rather than that excitement and joy to run out and embrace God, instead it's, let's hide. I need to get away from him. And God comes out, and he's like, where, where are you guys? And they're still hiding and calling out to him and saying, we saw you. We're no longer excited. We need to hide. Shame kills your self-worth. So the last thing, shame, that we want to touch on that's going to do to you guys, another item in your notes, is it distorts your calling. It distorts your calling. Okay? So now we're, we're, we've hit a couple characters. Now we're going to hit this guy, Peter, right? If anybody was called to do some amazing things, man, it's Peter. This guy is, he, again, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Uh, as you guys read about him, or if you already know about him, like when we read about him, isn't that the guy that you're like, man, I want to be like Peter, Right? Like that dude, even after sometimes that you're reading like, man, Peter, you're nuts, right? But there's times it's just like, man, I understand. I relate to, maybe some of you guys don't relate to Peter, but I relate to Peter, okay? But Peter was next level kind of guy, right? This was a passionate man, right? And so there's times like, like let me tell you, if we all saw a guy walking on water, okay, walking on water, we're going to be a little bit freaked out, especially if we don't know the story, right? It's not, we see a guy walking on water, we, we equate it to this. But if this is just... You know nothing, and some guy's walking on water. We are freaked out, right? Okay, who, who, when I brought it up, was like, no, actually, I tried to go out there and walk with him. Nobody, right? That's a, none of you guys have the thought process of being like, oh, there's a guy walking on water. Hey, dude, can I? Right? No, not quite, but that's Peter, man. Peter was just a guy that just trusted Jesus, right? 
He just loved Jesus so much, and he's like, man, I, I just... And Jesus tells him, hey, by the way, I'm going to get turned over to some soldiers. And Peter's like, no, not on my watch, dude. I'll kill them all. I ain't scared, right? And can I tell you, he really tried. Like this big old group of soldiers shows up, and Peter's like, I got you. Ah, and he takes an ear, and they're like, what are you doing? Come on, get out of here, right? That's what happens to Peter. So Peter is just a, a man. He's, he's just crazy, and he loves Jesus so much. But then he has a shame moment. He has a shame moment. So Jesus is turned over. He's there. And people are coming to Peter and they're saying, hey, aren't you, aren't you the dude that follows him? <laughs> not me, not I, not I, wrong guy. <laughs> pretty sure, dude, because I don't usually see things like that. I'm pretty sure you were right next to him when you fed like a million people with a fish. Nope, nope, wrong guy, wrong guy. Last time, right, three times he denies him, right? There's shame that Peter feels, right? And there's a calling that's been in his life. Three years, and it's intentional. Can I tell you it's intentional? They were called Jesus' disciples. Disciple means student. They knew that they were called to something greater. They knew it. They walked with Jesus for three years to understand what this calling looked like. So he knew he had a calling. But let's see what he does with it when Jesus um, has yet to come and visit him. It says, John 21, 3 and 4. This is what he does with his calling. He says, I'm going fishing. What happened to your calling? The disciples follow along. They say, we'll come too. So they all, that's what they all said. And so they went out in the boat. They caught nothing all night. That's what you get, catch nothing all night, right? Anybody who fishes, you know, like, that's the most frustrating part of the story, right? I stayed up all night. I got nothing to show for it, right? So we're looking at Peter's story. He's, he's been with Jesus three years. He knows he's supposed to do something afterwards. Jesus has already proclaimed, hey, I'm coming back after three days. I'm going to die, but I'm coming back, right? He's, they have all this knowledge, but Peter knows in his mind, this is his distorted thinking, right? He no longer thinks he's called. His shame has got him at such a point that he just says, man, i got to go back to my old life because this is it for me. I denied him three times. How am I ever going to go back? The shame has pulled me away from my calling. I am poison to the calling. Right? My decisions are so bad, my shame is so bad that anything I touch, anything I do, I have this poison, this bitterness in me that I'm going to poison everything I touch. Right? And so the shame, it's going to kill what you think is your calling. Okay? And we need to get away from that. And, and can I tell you the way we get away from that? The way we break free of shame is you've got to find your worth in Christ. Amen? Do you guys understand that? Because the problem is, as we look at all of these past stories, everybody was finding their worth where? Themselves, right? At these times, at these times in their moments of shame, they're looking inward and saying, I don't deserve. I did X. I deserve Y. This is who I am. The shame has got me away from all these things that I used to be. I'm a whole new person now. The past has haunted me. It's afflicted me. It's poisoned me. I'm no longer set forth for the great things that God has called me to. But we find the solution when we find our worth in Christ. Amen? So we're looking at Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. So who's? Jesus, right? Because of his blood, we enter into this place. It says, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Can I get an amen? That is a line that just, Ah! Gives you life, right? Because let me tell you something. Back in the day, there literally was the most holy place. Like if there was all the earth, there was literally this place that said, this is where God is most present. It is set apart. It is the most holy place. And what they used to do is there were like set priests that used to be able to go into there to do whatever rituals they had to do. And what they had to do is cover them with bells, right? And so when you're in there, you had to clang all the bells, right? This is probably a new dance move, but I don't know. You had to clang all the bells as you walk into the most holy place. You know why? Because then you'd randomly die sometimes. If you were not found worthy to be in there, boom, you're dead. So the bells stop clanging. What do you got to do? Oh, let's pull that rope. Dude didn't make it, right? Then next stop, right? Can you imagine being the next guy in line? Oh, okay, put the bells on me. Here we go, right? Oh, this is exciting. God says, that place, enter it boldly, right? So you got this curtain, now you just be like, ha, I am here, right? That's bold, right? 
Do you do the little Sparta kick and walk right into that place that says you enter it boldly? You don't got to walk in there shame and all your bells and freaked out that you're going to just pass away dead. No, no, no. Because of your worth in who? Jesus, right? Because of your worth in Christ, you could go into there boldly. Can I tell you who wrote this story? Paul. Can I tell you about some shame in Paul's life? Paul used to hunt Christians and see them to their death. Paul was responsible for the death of Stephen, who was like one of the major apostles of that time. And Paul is responsible. He has to look all these Christians, all these people that he's writing these stories to, all these people that he's writing the letters to. Yeah, I used to hunt you. Right? There's some shame there, right? But Paul can stand on this and look at this and say, hey, FYI, because of Christ, I get to enter the holy places. Amen? So let's look at some other stories. This is, we're going to go through what Jesus does in the moments of shame for others and how he handles the situations, because I think sometimes we distort it. So the first bullet point we got, guys, the th first thing you have to understand is you are clean. You are clean. Whatever it is that you think is covering your life, the disgust of whatever it is that you think covers you, whatever it is that you've seen, whatever it is that you've done, we automatically equate to, I've done bad, I am bad. I've done filth, I am filth. Nah, you are clean. Let's take a look at that. So we're looking at a story about a leper, right? Anybody seen leprosy? Oof, that is a beast, right? It does not look good, right? It's not a pretty sight. I don't like doing it, right? So lepers, they were all covered in these things, right? And they had it all over, and it was disgusting. And so this guy, they, when they used to have to walk through the streets, the rule was, if I touch you and I'm unclean, what does that make you? You're unclean too. So now you got to go see the priest and be like, hey, dude, that disgusting leper touched me, man. So now you got to go through this washing ritual and all this stuff. Like, it was a process, dude. And so this unclean leper has an encounter with Jesus. And let's take a look at that. Matthew 8, 2 and 3. It says, suddenly a man, so he had to sneak up. <laughs> he had to sneak up on Jesus. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. What does he want? He wants to be clean, right? I am tired of running through the streets talking about unclean. Are you guys tired of feeling so unclean? This is what Jesus does, right? It says Jesus reached out and touched him. There's times in Jesus' stories, in the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus just says, you're good, and they're good. He doesn't have to touch him. It's intentional, right? Jesus reaches out and touches him, and he says, I am willing. Ah, oh, that must have been everything to this man, right? He says, be healed, and instantly the leprosy disappeared. Tell me that's not a moment for that man, right? And so Jesus goes on to tell him, and he says, you know what? Go and tell the priests that you are clean. Show them, let them look you over, and they're going to see you're clean, right? And so he could physically see that the cleanliness there. The problem is, guys, is Jesus had this moment with you guys, right? But the problem is we look and we're like, no, 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 no. I still, be, I still belong in the leper colony, right? So we still go back there and we're still pouring and still feeling like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did that, God. It's still there. It's still there. And so we still walk around, talk about how unclean we are, talking about how we don't deserve and vice versa. The shame sometimes still sits in us. But Jesus reaches out and he's willing and he's willing to make you clean. And we think, man, God, if you'd seen the stuff I did, if you had seen how disgusting and all the wounds and all the sores and all the stuff that's in my life. Like, you wouldn't want any part of me. And Jesus says, no, 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 I'm reaching out to touch you. Amen? Amen. So the second point we're going to go over, guys. Second thing is you have been made righteous. Again, I think this is something that we kind of glance over, this word righteous. And it's something that we really have to fully embrace and understand. And so, again, we talked about, like, our judicial system, right? Who's guilty, not guilty, okay? So righteousness means that you are just. You're just. That means if you were put on trial and you had to stand before God and he's saying, all right, so what did you do? And remember, any, any sin, you're guilty, right? And death is the punishment, right? And so Jesus says, no, no, no. So you guys have been made righteous, right? So if you stand in court today, there is nothing on your slate that I can hold against you. You're innocent. That's what it means when you have been made righteous. Okay, so we're going to look at a moment in time when Jesus is facing somebody that the punishment should have been death and what he does with it instead, okay? You guys ever heard of Mary Magdalene? Yeah, right? right? So Mary Magdalene is caught in this moment where she's in an adultery. She's, she's been in adultery, right? And so if you can imagine this, 
It's not that somebody brought up before Jesus and said, hey, just so you know, yesterday she did this. No, no. In the moment, they grab her and pull her out of the street, dress in whatever she's dressed in, whatever situation she's in, and they cast her before Jesus. Guys, like the Son of God, right? Like the, it, Tell me if that's not the last place on earth you want to be in that moment of shame, right? And so as we all would, right, us people, somebody like that's thrown at you, I mean, imagine like your kids have done something bad, right? What do you give them, right? You give them the stink eye, right? Like, oh my gosh, how, how, ugh, you did what, right? And we'll be like, it's okay, it's fine. Ugh, right, the stink eye, right? Now, let me tell you what Jesus does. Jesus is my favorite, I love him. So this is what Jesus does, right? So this woman's thrown before him, and they say, uh, hey, Jesus, let's stone her. She's guilty. She deserves death. And she does. She does. Like, they're right. At that time, the law, they're right. But what does Jesus say? All right. He doesn't look at her. Let he without sin cast the first stone, right? He throws it out there to them, right? And then he doesn't give her stink eye. What does he do? He just chills down and starts drawing in the sand, right? Like, never did he put it on her. Right? Never did he look at her. I, I would think if this was our story, he looked at her and shook his head. Right? That's our caption. We put it, no. So he just starts drawing in the sand. Right? Not a big deal. Right? In this moment for her, this is everything. She is so ready for Jesus to shame her, to stone her, to kill her for the wrong she's done. And instead, Jesus is just like nonchalant. And could you imagine like the confusion? Like, okay, <laughs> is he going to surprise attack me? Like, what is about to happen? Right? And so Jesus has to finally talk to her because I would imagine as we all would be like, she is not looking around, right? Like she's not like doing this number like, who's, it? huh? Well, where's, even though some of the ninjas would be like, throw that stone, see what happens, right? No, she's head down, not paying attention. And Jesus says, hey, uh, where'd the ones go that accused you? She's like, look, oh, I guess they're gone, Jesus. Like it's, it's just you now. Let he without sin cast the first stone. Is Jesus without sin? Does he still have every right to throw the stone? Right? So Jesus says, nor do I. You gotta love him. Right? So she still has to be expecting something. Right? You have to be. It, this is your darkest moments, the darkest times and Jesus is standing over you, and you're just waiting for that next line. You're waiting for the next action. And he says, we're cool. I have nothing to accuse you of either. Go on. Don't do it anymore. Right? Like this momentous occasion, and Jesus just is acting like, man, you're fine. What's the big deal? Go out. Just don't do it again. Right? Like J Jesus knows how to handle those situations. Okay, I tell you, in your lives... You guys are looking at these shameful moments and sometimes they're cast in front of God and what do we do? We just run. Like, I will not face that. I will not stand in that moment. And Jesus just does the opposite, man. Hey, you're good, right? You're good. Let's take a look at where it even goes further than that. So we're going to take a look at Matthew. Oh, sorry, not Matthew. Fooled you. So we're going to take a look at, yeah, it is Matthew. Matthew 28, 5 through 10. So we're past this, right? Mary's already had this moment. She's a follower of Jesus now. She goes with him and it says, and he's, he's already been crucified. He's in the grave. Stones rolled away now and they're going to see him and find out where he's at. So it says, then the angel spoke to the women. He says, now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. So the angel's there and he says, hey, Get yourself to Galilee. Everybody get to Galilee. Jesus is going to find you there. You're going to have a good time. Amen? Okay, so then on the way, it says they're going, and it says Jesus met them and greeted them. Wait, where is Jesus supposed to meet them? Galilee, right? So he meets the two women on the way, and it says they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to him, don't be scary, right? Don't be afraid. He says, go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. He has noticed a repetition. Didn't the angel say exactly that already? Weren't they probably already going to go and do that? Right? So what is Jesus doing in this moment? Can I tell you, Jesus was all God and all man. And he loved. And if you can imagine, he's had 
this experience. He's gone through it all, and he comes back, and he's resurrected. He is excited to see them. He could not wait to see them. The moment's in Galilee, and Jesus says, I'm here now. I want to see them. Mary has gone from this person that's thrown before Jesus with all her shame, with all her guilt, waiting for the conviction to come upon her of all the stones upon her. And instead, she enters into this fellowship with Jesus and his disciples. And now it's to the point where Jesus goes out of his way to see her. Jesus loves you in all your shame, in all the guilt that you hold on to, in all the things that you think Jesus is trying to get away from. Like, Jesus, if you knew what I did, you would want to get as far away from me as you can. No, no, no. Jesus is finding moments to find you. Amen? Like, Jesus wants to be a part of your life. He wants to talk with you. He wants to give you the time and the love that you need. But it's us. It's man-made shame that keeps us away from him. Third bullet point is that we go from condemned to destined. Man, Paul, that was a man set for condemnation, was he not? That dude was a hunter of Christians, right? That dude was ready to be condemned. Peter, in his moments, right? Denying Jesus, bottom of the barrel, done with what he's done. Condemned, right? Feels condemned. Mary, condemned. All these moments where they're condemned, but then they're taken to destiny, right? The destiny that God has for them. Let me show you this. Let me show you somebody who deserved any piece of condemnation you could imagine at the time. It's a man named Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector. So if you guys don't know at the time, the tax collectors were actually like extorters, right? So if you could imagine today's time that we have the IRS, but the only way IRS makes money is off a commission. Right? So you owe, me, you owe the government 10 bucks, the Roman government, which Israel hates. So the Roman government tells Matthew, hey, get those people, those Jews, get them to pay me my money. But if you want any money, then you got to get them to give you more. So, okay, so you owe me 10 bucks, you owe the Romans 10 bucks, I need 15 right now. Give me 15. Right? And then they would go through because they had Roman authority. So they would use this third party Roman authority over the Jews. Could you imagine how much people hated them? Right? These were like the scum of the earth, man, especially because he was Jewish. So you're not a foreigner who came in there. You're one of us. Right? You're one of us who joined up with our foreign ruler, and you decided to join up with him and to take from us. Oh, man, we'd have hated that guy, right? So what do you think Jesus does like the first time he meets him? Right? So Jesus walks by, and Matthew's at his tax collector booth. Right? So like he's, it's not like he's turned from his ways. Right? It's not like he's finally in the moment where like, I've, I've changed my life. It's time for me to, no, no, no. So Matthew is right now sitting at his tax collector's booth doing his work. Jesus sees him and he says, hey, Matthew, join me, bro. Come on, join me. What? No, no, no. You have to see like remorse, right? Like you have to show, no, no, no. no. Jesus saw him. He said, come on, bro. What does Matthew do? He get, all right, let's go. Somebody's giving me a chance, right? Somebody's giving me a chance to better myself, to get out of this scum and filth that I'm in, right? So that's where we're at in Matthew 9, 9, 13. Jesus just called him and says, later Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners, right? Like they get their own category, right? Like there's tax collectors and then there's other disreputable sinners. Like these guys are so bad, they get their own category right so when the pharisees saw this they asked his disciples pharisees at that at this time were like the most respected religious leaders right we read the bible we see them as villains at this time like they were celebrated as like it like these guys knew what they were doing so these guys come into this situation they come into this home and they go to the disciples and say why does your teacher eat with such scum isn't this our biggest fear can we be honest right now this is our biggest fear of somebody who knew your life when you were in high school. And you're standing there and you're proclaiming, I follow Jesus. This is who I am. And somebody from high school says, bro, you're going to tell me that Jesus wants to hang out with such scum? Right? I remember you. You were the player, right? Or you did this. Or you always did this. Or you did that. Let's take a look. at And it's not even that. Like they're going to your friends, your circle, right? I love this. Who is it? They asked the disciples. They're not talking to Jesus. But Jesus heard it. He says, healthy people don't need a doctor, 
sick people do. He says, now go, like he's lecturing them now, right? He says, now go and learn the meaning. This is like the, the, the lawful people. They studied the law in and out. And Jesus says, go learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy and not offer sacrifices. And Jesus says, for I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Amen? Let me show you. Jesus didn't have to say anything. They're not even talking to him. But Jesus, out of his love for the sinner, Jesus, out of his love for those walking in shame and guilt, and somebody's out there trashing your name. Somebody's out there, whoever it is, is telling you you're not worth it. You're scum. You don't deserve. He's not even talking to Jesus. And Jesus steps in, right? Jesus says, hold up, hold up. You don't even know, right? Standing in on your behalf. Standing in on your behalf, even if you didn't ask for it at this time. And he says, no, 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 you don't understand. I came for you. Right? This is why I'm here. I didn't come here for the ones that you think are doing the holy, the mighty, the above, those who are so great. No, 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 no. I know your shame. I know your guilt. And that's why I came. For you in that moment. Not for after you recover and you've changed. No, for you in that moment. For your merry moment. When you're sitting there and saying, I deserve death, Jesus, I deserve it. No, no. In your moments of shame, Jesus says, I came for you right then. Right in there. You don't need to wait. You don't need to fix yourself. I'm here now. Isaiah 54, 4 says, Fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid, there is no more disgrace for you. It says, you will no longer remember the shame of your youth. How many of you guys no longer want to remember the shame of your youth? Right? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Can I tell you guys, you guys are destined, destined for something great. Every single one of you guys has a calling on your life, and you think that you're poison. You think that bitterness and gall still resides inside of you, but it doesn't. It's gone. And you are called for something greater. You are called and you are destined for something amazing. It says, your sin is as far as the east is from the west. Can I tell you? It's pretty far. Right? God's not still looking at you and saying, man, I can't believe you still do that. Nah. God's telling you, I, yeah, that, that's why Jesus came. Status quo, man. I love you right where you are. Let's work into your destiny. Amen? Bow your heads. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Some of you have just been dominated by shame in your life. Decision after decision after decision or just one major terrible decision continues to haunt you where you are in your life. It's time for a breakthrough. If you're saying today, God... Today, God, I need to understand what it means to be clean, to be righteous, to feel destined again. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand and tell yourself, I'm clean. We're going to pray for you right where you are. But a declaration that you are free from shame. On the count of three, one, two, three, lift your hand if you're saying you are free of shame. It haunts you no more. Amen. I see the hands. Amen. Fantastic. And some of you guys say, I've never encountered Jesus. I've never found him. I've never had that moment to say, I am forgiven. I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Today is that day. If today you are saying, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want to be clean. I want to be made righteous. If that's you, raise your hand. Raise your hand right now. Thank you. I see those hands. Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Fantastic. We're going to pray together, and I want you guys to let these words just be a part of who you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for who we are in you. God, we've lived a life that showed us who we are in ourselves. We've lived a life that's already showed us all the mistakes we could possibly make. God, we ask today that we find our worth in you. And God, you show us who you are. Show us your love. 
throughout the week, throughout the day, God, give us moments of clarity to know that we are made clean. There is no longer condemnation in our lives, God. We pray for the forgiveness, God, that you freely give to each and every one of us, God. We ask for the release of shame, the release of this holding on our lives. God, we know that you do not bring condemnation, God. You came to bring love. And I pray, God, that we understand that love as best as we can because you love us so much. Sometimes, God, your love is so much that it just does not, we can't comprehend it. And God, in our shame, in our guilt, we give it to you and we trust you with it and we know that you're not there to wrong us. You're not there to talk about how awful it is, God. You're there to tell us how much you love us and we love you, God. And we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Give God the glory. Amen. We are so thankful for all God is doing in and through your life, and we would love to continue helping you on your journey. To find out where your next steps are in your relationship with Christ, go to ilovediscovery.church forward slash next steps. At Discovery Church, it's our mission to teach people to love God passionately, love each other authentically, and change the world for the cause of Christ. And that mission drives everything we do as a church. Join us next week for part three of our Ghost of Christmas Past series.